It's not dangerous, just elite, here on episode 1337 of NES Works Guide N. By patron request, this episode brings us VideoWorks' first ever PAL release. Thanks to Imagineer, a PC classic made its way to European NESs in 1991. Braven and Bell's Space Simulation Elite. Look, I'm a person who spends very nearly all his waking time thinking about, reading about, learning about, and writing about old video games. I'm in deep and I always aspire to go deeper whenever possible. But despite my nearly 40 years of interest in gaming, despite constantly striving to expand my understanding of the history and influences that drive the medium, there are some areas of gaming that I've never been able to spend much time with. European 8-bit microcomputers of the 1980s are right there at the top of the list, right alongside Japanese computers of the 80s. For all that the ZX Spectrum and BBC Micro and PC8801 were profoundly foundational devices 30 or 40 years ago, they're also difficult for Americans to catch up on. I say all of this as a preamble to the fact that even a dumb American hick like me knows what a big deal Elite was. Even if there hadn't been a heavily hyped virtual reality follow-up a few years back in the form of Elite Dangerous, there's realistically no way anyone who has even a vague interest in the history of this medium could have missed out on the countless tributes, testimonials, and citations Elite has received through the years. It was a game that truly transcended its limitations, created by just two men, Ian Bell and David Braben, for impossibly underpowered 8-bit computer hardware, Elite somehow managed to span an entire galaxy, incorporate a sophisticated physics model, integrate a complex trade-based economy, allow players to maneuver through immersive 3D space, and basically exist as an open-world adventure driven by its own clearly defined rules, despite the seeming impossibility of such a thing within the technical boundaries of the era. It was, in short, a miracle of design and programming, and it consistently topped British lists of greatest games of all time. Elite came into existence in an era where the limited capabilities of gaming devices set most people's expectations somewhere in the basement. So naturally, a game that gave them the stars made an impression. Elite also debuted at a time in which games and players shared a very different relationship than they do now. Steam sales and piles of shame didn't exist in 1984, and you could practically count on your hands the number of worthwhile games in existence that took dozens of hours to complete in the modern sense of saving and restoring progress over the duration of a lengthy adventure, and occasional large-scale RPGs like Ultima 3 and Wizardry. By the standards of 1984, Elite was like nothing else that had come before it. Its scale and complexities were such that players were only too happy to spend months coming to terms with the rules and peculiarities of a game that literally spanned galaxies and aspired to be every bit as unforgiving as true space travel. By the time the NES port launched in 1991, of course, we lived in a different world altogether. Expansive games had become the rule, rather than the exception. Even on consoles, and even in Europe, where NES games frequently shipped years after their debut in Japan or the US, game enthusiasts had no shortage of sprawling quests jockeying for their time and attention in 1991. The next generation of consoles had begun to appear on shelves, offering even greater depth and considerably more impressive visuals than Elite's stark wireframes. Needless to say, Elite on NES didn't have quite the same impact on the industry as it had had in its original incarnation for the BBC Micro platform seven years prior. It was, nevertheless, a tremendous achievement, and in some quarters it's seen as the best and most accessible version of the game, though unlike Wizardry, that claim doesn't have the game's original creator's endorsement behind it. Still, it's an amazing feat. Elite should have been impossible on the NES, a console built around displaying bitmap sprites and rendering its backgrounds as raster tiles. Elite made use of vector-style wireframes to allow players to move freely through the inky blackness of space in three true dimensions. Its ships and space stations are meant to scale smoothly and rotate with fluid grace, creating a hollow yet convincing simulation of space travel and combat. Somehow the NES version manages to reproduce this graphical style, a feat so unlikely, I feel like it must have helped inspire Argonaut to put together X, aka Lunar Chase, for the similarly limited Game Boy a year later. Elite on NES may well be one of the most impressive technical achievements on the platform, the irony being that Imagineer pulled off this great accomplishment to recreate the look of a game that ran on an underpowered home computer seven years earlier. Despite the original codebase for Elite clocking in at a few dozen kilobytes, in all honestly, it's far too large a game for the NES. This version creaks and groans from the stress of cramming so much into a console designed, fundamentally, to do a pretty good job of playing Donkey Kong. It's not that Elite requires more storage or RAM than the NES could handle. By 1991, NES games consistently shipped on ROMs offering two or three times the size of the original Elite program. 
but Elite is a vast, complex game built to make full use of a keyboard interface and that doesn't scale down well to a two-button controller. Although a fair few developers had managed to adapt PC-oriented genres to fit within the NES's limitations, these efforts generally involved building all new games from the ground up. Consider Dragon Quest with its windowed menus and streamlined design, making it a far better fit for the console than, say, FCI's attempts to squeeze SSI Goldbox Dungeons & Dragons games onto the console. Elite on NES was not a wholly new invention, or an attempt to rebuild the PC space sim concept within the bounds of a console. It was an attempt to bring Elite to the console in all its intricacy. A bold effort, but one that requires a sizable investment of time, energy, and patience from the player. This is not a game that rewards the impatient or hasty. Elite, especially in its NES incarnation, requires the ability to settle in, plan ahead, and accept the inevitability of colossal failures necessitating a complete restart. For those who wanted a quick fix, ASCII and Acclaim had already settled that back in 1987 with Cosmogenesis, also known as Star Voyager. As commenters here have pointed out, that game had clearly been patterned in the likeness of Elite, all the way down to the spinning effect as you dock with a space station. Elite is not that stripped down barebones experience. Only its visuals look sparse. In terms of content, this cartridge manages to encompass dozens upon dozens of planets across an entire galaxy. Well, technically there are several galaxies here, though it's rare that you need to venture out that far. There's plenty to be done in your home galaxy, and plenty that can go wrong. At heart, Elite comprises a futuristic trading simulation, a sort of single-player take on Mule. Your ultimate goal is to move up the ranks of space-based tradecraft, accumulating wealth and, in turn, a more powerful fighter to ferry you about from star system to star system. At its most basic level, Elite isn't that complicated. You purchase supplies, sell and trade them, and build your war chest. In practice, however, Elite requires you to juggle a lot of details. Your basic fighter craft has a limited fuel capacity, which means you can only warp a limited distance at a time. This keeps your early options fairly finite, requiring you to learn the workings of the few systems within reach. Trade commodities sell for different prices depending on where you visit, and each system has a distinct culture and political situation that determines not only which items are coveted, but how likely its people are to trade with you. There's also a dark underbelly to the galaxy. You can purchase illicit trade goods, which can potentially get you busted when you stop at a port and you're hardly the only one out there working in the gray. As you travel between systems, there's a possibility that you'll be intercepted by enemy marauders that you'll be forced to fend off. And it's equally possible that even if you do survive them, you'll be stranded between star systems and forced to abandon ship. While the game does prepare you for the eventuality of combat right from the start, there's a difference between that opening combat simulation and the real thing in the dead of space, especially if the pirate's ships outmatch yours. This also points to the difficulty inherent in mapping Elite's complex controls to the dinky NES gamepad. Just about everything you do in Elite involves a series of button combinations, with the select button serving as a sort of shift modifier, and that includes combat. Honestly, this is Elite's greatest failing on NES. It's just too cumbersome to control in the gamepad. And sadly, the UK market where Elite was exclusively released for NES never saw some of the more versatile controllers created for Famicom, like the NTT Data Input Controller. I freely admit Elite is a difficult NES game to get into nearly 30 years later, but I could also see myself becoming engrossed with the experience had it been released in the US at the time. The sheer size of the game and the intricacy of its simulation makes it one of the biggest and most ambitious releases ever for the NES. It's a feat of technical wizardry, and it deserves respect for its mere existence. There are better ways to play Elite these days, but there's still something unique about having this PC classic in cartridge form.